Um, it is my assumption that the phrase needs no introduction applies here with Robert Pinsky. So with that in mind, I will not serve as an introducer, but instead as something perhaps of a character witness. I've worked with Robert for the better part of 15 years at the New York State Summer Writers Institute, and he predates me there. And during that time, we've shared countless meals, swapped stories, exchanged enthusiasms and bafflements and shared the podium for an evening reading. And as both participant and observer, I can confirm the following. Robert is generous, Robert is kind and attentive, and in any conversation, Robert is interested, curious, opinionated, and present. And his readings, always memorable, bring a mix of joy, intellect, and musicality, and all in a manner that somehow conjure a real-time paradox between the stentorium in the Colosseum and the intimate whisper of a confidant in a small private space. In Robert Pinsky, we have a poet who is fiercely committed to art, fiercely committed to believing in the best potentials of humanity. And in times such as these, when we need guidance and wisdom, perspective and clarity, truth and honesty, Robert is among the few we know we can turn to. As the pandemic overtook our lives, beginning our national confusion and personal disorientation. Who didn't find solace in opening the Washington Post one mid-April morning to see Robert sitting in his home, giving voice and perspective to the fear and worries of isolation, telling us heavy with longing, in my mind, is preferable to hollow. If I am heavy with longing, at least I still have some idea of what I want. And such is what we've come to ex expect in this writer, the search for and belief in the connective spirit of humanity, an argument for the link between intellect, body, and spirit, and a constant call for life. Please welcome Robert Pinsky. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, that is beautiful introduction. If about 70% of it is true, I will be happy and self-congratulatory. Um, I'm going to try to make what I do suit the necessity of doing this, not in person, but virtually. So uh, I'll tell you my plan. My plan is to read a few poems that I wrote a long time ago, and then I'm going to show you some videos that I hope very brief, a couple of one-minute videos, maybe another five-minute video, that will show what I think I'm doing when I write these things with ragged right typography and capital letters at the beginnings of lines. And then I'm hoping that would take maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes, then I'm hoping we'll have a kind of early Q&A uh, and um, I, I, I tend to welcome kind introductions. Uh, Adam quoted, uh, he quoted some lines from a poem. I'll start with the poem that Adam quoted from. The poem is called House Hour. Uh, there are a lot of people from different times of my life here tonight. There are two or three people I went to high school with, I'm happy to say. Uh, there's recent colleagues, and uh, this poem is about a certain kind of neighborhood, like the neighborhood I grew up in, uh, multifamily houses. I, when I was deciding to move back to Boston from uh, beautiful California, from Berkeley, I think my wife and I made the decision when we were in that kind of neighborhood here in Somerville, Mass. House hour. Now the pale honey of a kitchen light burns in an upstairs window, the sash across. Milky daylight moon. Sky scored by foam lines. Houses in rows, as patient as cows. 
Dormers and gables of an immigrant street in a small city, the wind-worn afternoon shading into night. Hundreds of times before, I have felt it in some district of shingle and downspout at just this hour, the renter walking home from the bus carrying a crisp bag, maybe a store visible at the corner, neon at dusk, macaroni mist on the glass, unwilled, seductive as music, brief as dusk itself, the forgotten mirror brushed for dozens of years by the same gray light, the same shadows of soffit and beam end, a reef of old snow glowing along the walk. If I am hollow or if I am heavy with longing, the same. The same ponderous houses of siding, fur framing, horsehair plaster, fire bricks in a certain light, changing nothing but touching those separate rooms of the past those separate hours, and now, at this one time of day, touching this one, last spokes of light silvering the attic dust. I'll read a poem. I'll wet the instrument and then read a poem. I guess instrument is a little joke, but a thing I want to communicate to the students and others is that uh, poetry is much more like singing and dancing. It's even much more like sports than some preconceptions. It's physical. It has to do with what you do with your breath and your mouth. Um, I visited a school for the, uh, for the deaf. And there, it's what you do. The kids, when they read their poems, vocalized, but they also signed at the same time. It's all of the above, but it comes out of the body. This poem is the poem I chose to put first in this book, um, my selected poems. Rhyme. Rhyme. Air and instrument of the tongue the tongue an instrument of the body, the body an instrument of the spirit, the spirit a being of the air. Each bird the medium of its song, each song a world, a containment, like a hotel room ready for us guests who inherit our compartment of time there. In the Joseph Cornell box among ephemera as its element, the preserved bird, a study in spontaneous elegy, the parrot, art, mortal in its cornered sphere. Each room a stanza rung in a laddered filament, clambered by all us unsteady chambered voices that share it, each one reciting, I too was here. I too was here in a room, a rhyme, a song, in the box, in books, each element an instrument, the body still straining to parrot the spirit, a being of the air. Home is called Rhyme. I like to quote a very favorable review of the book that said, it's like Robert Pinsky to write a poem called Rhyme that doesn't rhyme. In fact, it does. Tongue, instrument, body, spirit, air, song, containment, ready, inherit, there, among elements, studied, paraphr well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but I guess it matters for what I'm trying to say tonight, which is that the sounds of language and that language and the art of poetry in particular is right at the juncture between the body and the mind. And uh, the first one minute videos I'm gonna show you are of, a, are of babies. You're gonna see a 10 week old baby, that young, 
the 10 week old baby. And I feel like you're seeing that. They tell me there's the part of the brain that has to do with our social life and also with working our speech. And you can see how much he loves, how hard he's working and how much he likes that experience. So I'm going to share my screen now. And I think I first will show you the baby. And then I may immediately show you one of the videos I made at favoritepoem.org, which was an adult saying a poem that he didn't write. Uh, and then I think I'm going to invite questions. Then there'll be a really embarrassing silence if nobody has anything to say. And I may be forced to read other poems. Uh, but first, I will share screen. Then you want to have a conversation? Um, 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 and what date is it? Is it June 6th? I. I. What do you think, Pat? Thank you. I thought so. Okay, bye-bye. So you get that one last high. Uh, and I can't prove it to you mathematically, but when I see that face, I feel he's doing what is the appeal of the art of poetry, and he's taking pleasure in it. The next is 18 months old, year and a half. And what I'm interested in, and again, is the pleasure, how much fun it is for the kid, and how precisely he talks the bubble talk. Uh, he gets the rhythms and the exact consonants of the nonsense double talk he's hearing. He is an expert already at reproducing what he hears. So Maga Waga Do is produced very, very accurately. And uh, now uh, these are the videos. They're about five minutes each. And uh, I'm going to choose one where I think the guy speaks very convincingly. Here, I'll just let you see him read it. And then I'm going to unshare screen, and I'm going to hope that either through chat or voice or some way, uh, somebody's going to respond to what I'm trying to say. And you all will let me know if I'm messing up the technology. I remember very well that I came home and I was really upset. And I, it, it was a date situation. I wanted to go out with this girl and I just ended up feeling very bad at the end of it. It just didn't work out the way I wanted it to. It, I just ended up feeling kind of lonely and, and bereft, I suppose. I came home and I opened this book and I read some of the poems and up until that point, I think my sense of poetry was that it was always this sort of grandiose, for lack of a better term, highfalutin, uh, not very real way of using language. And I looked at this stuff and I could not believe it. It was light years beyond anything else I'd ever read. It was powerful, it was rough, it was 
bitter, it was caustic, and it was at the same time really urgent about a need for love. I was amazed that here's a woman who was from a very well-heeled New England existence, and the stuff that she wrote really spoke to me. Uh, a man, a Jamaican immigrant, I and mean, you could hardly get two people in the world more distant in terms of socioeconomic, uh, intellectual, uh, and um, and religious realities. But she spoke to me. She spoke to me. She spoke. It seems directly to my life, and uh, because of that, I I. I've always loved her work. And I think in some ways, her work was sort of an entree for me into the larger world of art. And I think when I started looking at other poets and started looking at the world of visual art, it was because of class. I think that you can have deep, profound, transformative experiences but in a quiet setting. And I think actually the quiet setting, and, and I think of this in terms of my lighting, creating this kind of emotional hush. It's, it's a place where you can, the viewer can come to and gain access to these other places. This is Nick and the Candlestick by Sylvia Plath. I am a miner, the light burns blue. Waxy stalactites drip and thicken. Tears, the earthen room exudes from its dead border. Black bat airs wrap me, baggy shawls, cold homicides. They weld to me like plums. Old cable calcium icicles, old echoes, even the newts are white, those holy jewels. And the fish, the fish, Christ, they are pains of ice, a vice of knives, a piranha religion, drinking its first communion out of my live toes. The candle gulp and recovers its small altitude, its yellows hearten. Oh, love, how did you get here? Oh, embryo, remembering even in sleep your cross position, the blood blooms clean in you, ruby. The pain you wake to is not yours. Love, love, I have hung our cave with roses, with soft rugs, the last of Victoriana. Let the stars plummet to their darker dress. Let the mercuric atoms that cripple drip into the terrible well. You are the one solid the spaces lean on, envious. You are the baby in the bar. I love this poem because it's crazy, because it's headlong, it's brutal, it goes all over the place, and it does not proceed rationally. The first line is, I am a miner and the light burns blue. You're a miner? And what, what blue light? What are you talking about? And the last line is like this gift from the God. So, am I back here? The Favorite Poem Project is made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts, fostering America's creativity and investing in our living cultural heritage. Did I fail to? Are we back? back? Yeah. Okay, I don't see myself, but if you can hear me and see me, we are well. Now, uh, 
The technology makes it harder maybe to break the little shyness, but um, let's see if we can have a conversation. I promise that any question that people have, any remark you want to make, I am going to treat it respectfully. Robert, there's a question already in the, the queue here. So okay. I will. Others? Okay, Kyla, you're, you're live. All right. Um, hi. Um, I, so my question for you today, um, I was wondering how you would describe the relationship between poetry and emotion and why it is that you think poetry is so important and prominent in times of high emotion, such as our times that we're living in right now. I find poetry seems to become important to people at times of communal emotions. Uh, anybody who writes poetry knows that your friends, when there's a funeral or a wedding, they say they have, they have a poem to suggest, uh, funerals and weddings. And now we have in the largest possible community, uh, a societal crisis and poetry gets important. The relation between poetry and art for me has to do with my feeling that emotion is there all the time. Thoughts are there all the time, all day long. It's rattling around in here. And uh, I'm feeling sad, sexual, hungry, drowsy, bored, angry, pleased, amused, irritated, all at the same time and swirling around in different proportions. Something happens when an arrangement of vowels and consonants calms that down a little bit. There's a little bit less chatter on the roof of my brain. I'll give you my favorite super short example. It's a poem written I guess 150 years ago by Walter Savage Landor. Two line poem. Here is the two line poem of Landor. And I'm thinking about your question, Kyla. On love, on grief, on every human thing, time sprinkles Lethe's water with his wing. On love, on grief, on every human thing, time sprinkles Lethe's water with his wing. Speaking of babies, I've learned I can recite that or recite Yeats to an infant. It's like singing to the infant. The child is comforted. So even if I don't know what Lethe is, I know it's what time sprinkles on everything. And not engulfs, but sprinkles. My point is, that like the baby learning how to say hi, and very pleased that he comes close to saying hi, it's a physical experience. Three times at the beginning of that poem, I put my upper teeth on my lower lip, on love, on grief, on every human thing. Three times at the end, I purse my lips, Time sprinkles Lethe's water with his wing. When Walter Savage Landor, a very rich, upper class, great Latinist Englishman, wrote that poem, my various ancestors were running away from Cossacks or selling the Cossacks liquor all around Poland and Belarusia. None of them knew this language. But here I am, 150 years later, my lips and my teeth and my feelings as a result, I get to feel what it would feel like to need to say that about love and grief and everything. And what I would add to your question, Kyla, about emotion and poetry is that it has to do with that feeling of the baby liking to communicate 
with the voice that's looking down at him, speaking to him. Or liking to reproduce Aga Waga Maga Du. There is an interpersonal or social or erotic component of why we love the art of poetry. It's older than prose. It's deeply related to its sister song. And it goes very deep in us. It goes very far in. Thank you, yes. Okay, um, other questions? Robert, we have questions both in the, um, uh, for live questions and in the Q&A. Let me jump to the Q&A, we'll try to go back and forth. Um, and this question comes from Thea Schiller. <clears throat> says, I understand what you say about poems being our entire body. When I'm with my one and, and two-year-old grandchildren, uh, or two and two, uh, two and two, one and two slash two-year-old grandson, he points to a squirrel and says, ah, ga, 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 as if he is the first person to see a squirrel. And for me, it is our position as poets to say, look, look, this is what I am seeing, and I want you to see it too. What do you think about this? I think the one or two year old has seen a lot of language. He's seen a lot of people around him using language to say what they're seeing. And if the best he can do is he's happy with it. This is very much like singing, dancing, sports. I'll insert the sad fact that we have to be taught that we don't like poetry. The way somebody has to teach you, people say, I can't dance. I don't know how to dance. You did when you were two years old. The band starts at the wedding and you start shaking your ass around. And you have to be taught. All the little kids like to run after the ball. Somebody has to teach you, oh, no, Adam is good at sports. You aren't. And then you say, oh, I can't play ball. Uh, this is one of the prices we pay for civilization and you know, I earned my bread as a teacher, have most of my life, and uh, sometimes we do harm, but we try not to. Uh, so that one-year-old, two-year-old, it's not that he's, it, it's, it's not simply uh, that he's the first time, he, uh, first person ever to see a squirrel. He's imitating all the times he's seen anybody point to anything and say, look, it's a tractor, or it's uh, kind of dangerous, or it makes me think, or... It's a cantaloupe. He's used to these grunts that uh, we have evolved to be very, very communicative. Great. Thank you, Robert. We have a question now from Carol Peters, who is live to talk. I'm listening, Carol. Hi. Uh, hello from Spokane. Hi. When you you're doing your reading at Gonzaga. You had a little jazz combo with you. Is that something that you do often? Whenever I get a chance. There are two CDs uh, with the great pianist uh, Lawrence Hobgood. Um, I did a CD called Poem Jazz and one called House Hour. Uh, I started off wanting to be a musician. And uh, for me, there, as I already said, it's so much like song. I am a non-singing vocalist. I have worked, uh, I did a show with Bruce Springsteen uh, uh, in uh, Fairleigh Dickinson in New Jersey. I have worked with an Irish band. Uh, if any musicians are willing to try to improvise together, I am eager and glad to do it. And I always try to make it actually musical. They're not accompanying me. We're listening to one another and we're trying to make it one performance. And I remember it was a piano player named uh, Seals. I think it's Mark Seals. He was wonderful. Uh, it's quite a while ago, I think, that we did that uh, at Gonzaga. So the answer to that is yes, exclamation mark. Thank you. Pleasure, Carol. Uh, I'm happy to read some more stuff at this okay. point. We've got a couple more questions. Can I give okay, you let's do that, and then we'll do a finish with some poetry. Okay, okay. Let's, let's do so, that. Um, uh, I'm going to jump ahead to because there's a question from Harvey here that um, 
is related to what you're saying, and that is, has your poetry been set to music by anyone um, that you're aware of? Quite a lot. The wonderful composer Ezra Latterman has said quite a few of my poems. Um, it's often been done. I wrote the libretto for an opera by Todd Macover that was premier, premiered at the uh, L'Opera de Monte Carlo. It was performed in uh, here in Boston and uh, Texas and California. It's a different art. I'm much more confident when I'm reading things I've written or that someone else has written with musicians than when I'm trying to write something for musicians. Famous dialogue uh, between uh, Stéphane Mallarmé and uh, uh, his friend. The, the composer says, after the performance of Lac Midi Don Fon, he says, my friend, Stéphane, how did it feel to hear your poem set to music? And that bastard Mallarmé says, I won't attempt it in French, but he says, that's what I thought I was doing when I wrote it. So there's the music one is written into it. So uh, yeah, my work has been set to music and I appreciate it, I'm very proud of it. But for me, it's, uh, I'm not such a hot songwriter. It's different, it's a different art. So Robert, there are three more questions currently. Do you want to read and come back to questions or do you want yeah, to? hear what people have to say. Okay. Um, we have Jillian Damiani, who is a student here at Roger Williams. Um, hi. So, oh, Jillian. Hi. Uh, so my question was, um, you discussed how art and crises are interconnected. Uh, do you think without crises we would have no good art? And do you think that... Without, you're talking a little fast for me. Without... Do you think uh, without crises, we would have no good art? And do you think we'll have a kind of renaissance post-pandemic? Um, everything kinetic. It, it is always something is rolling downhill. There's always something happening. Uh, drama began with uh, uh, religious plays on the steps of churches. And it turned out the most popular parts were when the devil would come out, firecrackers attached to his ass. Uh, something is always going wrong in my experience. Something is always not right. So the crisis in a social level brings out the craving for art. But what do we do all day? We play video games, we watch uh, videos, we read. Our hunger for art is so deep in the animal that there's always some form of crisis. If there isn't one, we invent one. If I win a prize, then I think, oh, now I've won a prize. Everybody will be paying attention to me. And uh, they will say, what are you going to do next? You won a prize. What now? Uh, so the happiest thing in the world, there's always some next step. Uh, even in love, Baudelaire says in his prose poem about love, there's always a changing degree to which one person is the surgeon, the other is the patient. One person, person is the tormentor, the other is tormented. So I, yes, Gillian, I think there is a kind of a curve, especially a communal one. And there's always going to be an appetite for art. It's always going to be inspired by one kind of personal or general crisis, and it will never be completely filled. We always want more. Thank you. Okay, Robert, this question comes from Susan Tayson. It says, rhyme was such a beautiful journey of rhyme words blocking and tumbling over one another and changing along the way. Could you speak about the power of repetition in poetry, in expression, in the world at large, perhaps especially now? Uh, my wife is writing a psychoanalytic piece based on Freud's, uh, I think it's called Repeating, Repetition, and Working Through. It's a basic, basic thing is repetition. It can be a curse and it can be a blessed relief. All poetry rhymes. It isn't always in rhyme. You know, with my poem, I said, 
you know, a Hmong song, the, 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 the rhymes are sort of hidden. Uh, it isn't always that you got to rhyme because it's in time to do what you need whenever you bleed. But uh, one of my examples of this is William Carlos Williams's poem about the roofers. Now they're resting in the fleckless light separately and in unison, like the sacks of sifted stone stacked regularly about the flat roof, ready after lunch to be opened and strewn. The copper and eight foot strips has been beaten lengthwise at right angles and lies ready to edge the coping. One still chewing, picks up a copper strip and runs his eye along it. In a conversation with my students, uh, at uh, BU, the MFA program, this week, uh, I presented that poem as an example of rhyme in unrhymed poetry. Now they're resting separately. Now they're resting in the fleckless light separately. It's in the key of eh, in unison, in unison, like the sacks of sifted stones stacked regularly about the flat roof ready after lunch to be opened and strewn. And I'm exaggerating the words to show how repetition of like sounds is at the heart of poetry. The best prose writers do it a lot too. If you pick up Adam's writing, you will find repetitions of syntax, you'll find repetitions of sound, and the degree and kind of like and unlike sounds is always varying, it's always different, and you can never predict how a master is going to do it. Emily Dickinson turned the hymn and the ballad inside out, and she made a new kind of music. Right, I've got three more questions here. Do you want to take these last three, Robert, and then finish with some reading? There... Okay. Um, so um, this is, comes from Rachel DeWoskin, if I'm pronouncing it right. That Plath reading was stunningly moving, especially in the context of your poems and the videos of babies speaking their poems. Can you talk a little bit about how you came up with the favorite poem project, what it meant to you and to others, and why it is such connections like the one we saw in that reading, uh, and why it is that such connections like the one we saw in that reading happen in such a particular way through poems. Uh, if anybody here has not read a novel or a book of poetry by Rachel DeWoskin, I urge you to recommend it highly. Honored to be asked a question by Rachel. That project, it fulfilled something that goes back to my childhood where I grew up in a town where there are a lot of different ethnic groups mixed together. The part of it I lived in was not rich. Uh, my parents didn't go to college, but they were very good talkers, very good looking people, and they were part of a very aspirational American attitude toward culture, founded largely in the American public school system. You'll find a lot of immigrants of the generation of my grandparents named their children things like Sidney and Milton and Herbert because English lit and the English language was so important to them. And I wanted my laureate project not to be preaching to people, not to be telling them poetry is good, it's good for you. You should, you should like it. If you don't, you're bad. Instead, we designed one where you ask, not tell, ask people, do you have a poem that you love? And it was very quickly discovered that it was indeed had a lot to do. It had a lot to do with how it sounded. And as editor, I was glad to have poems by Langston Hughes and Sylvia Plath and William Shakespeare not always my taste, my standards. And that goes back to Long Branch and growing up in whatever you want to call it, a working class or a lower middle class family that wanted the best. If poetry is a ruling class art, and if the ruling class in the democracy is supposed to be the people, then it should be the best. So those are some of the social attitudes 
behind the videos at favoritepoem.org. Great. Robert, I'm going to um, just read all the, que the remaining questions to you okay. because yeah, some of this may... Either, and then do a couple of poems. Good. Yeah, because some of these may combine. So we have one, these two, um, a little bit more connected but from Robert Powell and from Francisco Aragon. Mm -hmm. um, and from Robert Powell, he says, I read Woodworth's Ode recently after not having read it for decades. I was floored by it in my 60s to the core, and it was nothing to me in my 20s. There's clearly more than sound to poetry, as important as it is. What can you say about that explosive combination of sound and sense? And then the question from Francisco Aragon is, a quote, uh, a poem is not a fully realized work of art until it's uttered aloud by someone other than the author, unquote. You said that 40 years ago to me at Berkeley. How did you come to this conviction? Those are <laughs> Francisco, so those... a wonderful poet. Uh, I have his, I have a new, his new book of poems, Ruben Dario is the, I forget the title. Anyway, I came to that conclusion as the experience of giving poetry readings, partly trying not to be boring and realizing that poetry is in a way the most physical art. Dance is more physical, but it's an artist, but it's a trained body. The poem gets under your skin. It's when someone else says it. And that at some point about when Francisco was my student, I thought, I realized that was the highest ambition a poet can have, is to write something that someone else would want to say. It's different from being a singer songwriter. It isn't presenting your own performance skills. If I'm giving a reading, I'd like not to be boring, but the great, to be as Sylvia Plath was to Seth Rodney, to be as Langston Hughes is to Pove Chin in that other video. That, uh, that's what Chico and I aspire to. Uh, maybe I should just close with, uh, with, what are the other questions? Um, there was the one about Woodworth, about, uh, about the ode, uh, Wordsworth ode yeah. about being more meaningful yeah. um, later in life. And then there's a question from Elizabeth Cage in Sydney, Australia. Yes. Um, asking, um, what art are you engaging with now? And um, what do you read, uh, particularly uh, in conjunction with the times, you know, what, what, what are you drawn to reading and listening to? Um, and then there's one question in the live questioning, if, if you're up for one more after, after that. Yeah. Um, I always have trouble saying what I'm reading because I'm always reading uh, several things at once. Uh, I was reading Thomas Hardy this afternoon for some reason probably with similar reasons that uh, one would read that Wordsworth Ode, different times in your life, you have different attitudes. Wordsworth's Ode is all about uncertainty and doubt and feeling, are you quite sure? And uh, I remember when I was in my 60s, you begin to become a little bit unsure and to wonder. And uh, this comes at different times in life. I saw a wonderful quotation somewhere that you never feel older than when you're in your late or middle 20s. Uh, but maybe it comes back again in your middle 60s. And uh, it's easier for me to answer the question from Australia about what I did. Just yesterday, I finished a prose autobiography. Uh, I sent it to my great agent, who's also a great editor, Jill Neerum. She'll probably tell me 150 things I need to improve. But in some way, uh, through these trying times, through a great national anxiety and dread and calamity, uh, if somehow it was comforting me to go back and uh, start with my mom making fun of my dad and then go to the favorite poem project. Uh, it was okay. I liked it. And uh, so I, I officially congratulate myself. I finished at least, at least one draft 
of an autobiography. Um, I'll read a couple of poems. Well, Robert, I want to interrupt one second because you have one more question I think completely yes. ties to what you're talking about from someone I'm presuming you went to high school with thinking of um, autobiography. <laughs> so, um, so I'll let them, uh, Bill, I, I guess, uh, ask the question. Oh, we'll, Bill Gilday. We'll yeah. But he knows so many terrible things about me when I was <laughs> in teens. It's, uh, I, maybe we should just eject him. Okay, Bill, <laughs> let's, let's hear it. Oh. Maybe all of us who are you go. All of us who graduated with you are most proud of your accomplishments, especially the poet laureate. It's rare to have known someone with as much panache as you've shown in your poetry and in your life. We truly appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I call you also as a witness. There were a certain number of people, including Mr. Kolobas and uh, others, uh, would have said, that guy? Him? Right? <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> it, had to, it had to be that guy. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Forkevich? Mr. Forkevich would have said, that kid's no good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad that you and Marina and Michael Betkin are here. I, I saw you on the list, and uh, it means a lot to me. Uh, this book that I just uh, finished, Long Ranch, is very, very much in there. We come from an historic town. Long Branch uh, is where the American concept of celebrity was invented. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, just uh, down the road, Springsteen, too, so... Well, yes, yes. Um, he played he played those bars in Atlantic City. Anyway, we won't go on. <laughs> um, here is a here is a poem. I, I've been using this word, so I'll read it. I don't mean to be a downer, and it's not. Uh, here is a poem called "Grief." Grief. I don't think anybody ever is really divorced, said Lenny. Also, I don't think anybody ever is really married, he said. Because English was really Lenny's second language, and because of Yiddish and its displaced place in the world, he never really believed in his own prose. He wrote sentences the way a great boxer moves. Near the end, Lenny told me, I'm in hell. Something Lenny might have said about hunting for a parking space in Berkeley. Mike, too, was himself. His last month, too weak to paint or make prints, he sat and made drawings of flowers, ink attentive to the rhythms of beech rose, wisteria, lily, forms like acrobats or Cossack dancers. Mike had a vision of his body dead on his studio floor seen from high above. He didn't feel sad or afraid at seeing it, he said, just sorry for the person who would find it. You can't say nobody ever really dies. Of course they do. Lenny died. Mike died. But the odd thing is, but the odd thing is, the person still makes a shape distinct and present in the mind as an object in the hand. The presence in the absence. It isn't comfort. It's grief. I have 756. I think if I read the, uh, the first poem, Instrument, in uh, my most recent book at the Foundling Hospital. I think we'll just come out exactly at eight o'clock. And the Roger Williams students, the high school friends, uh, Elizabeth Cade from Australia, someone calling from Spokane, thank you very much. You helped me try to make the best of relying on technology because of the great national pickle that we're in.
So I will close with this poem. I've used the word in a previous poem. I used it when I got my glass of water, so I'll wet the instrument. This poem is about what is good and bad in us that makes art. It's the first poem in at the Foundling Hospital. Uh, so I will say goodbye and thanks to you all with instrument, instrument. It was a little newborn God that made the first instrument. Sweet vibration of mind, mind, mind enclosed in its orbit. The little God scooped out a turtle shell and he strung it with a rabbit's guts. Well, what a stroke to invent music from an empty case strung with bloody filaments. The wiry rabbit flesh plucked or strung, pulled taut across the gutted, resonant hull of the turtle. Music from the hollow shell and the insides of a rabbit. Sweet conception, sweet instrument of mind, 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 mind itself a capable vibration, thrumming from here to there in the cloven brain flesh contained in its helmet of bones. Like an electronic box full of channels and filaments bundled inside a case, a little musical robot dreamed up by the mind, embedded in the brain with its blood-warm channels and its humming network of neurons, engendering the newborn baby God, as clever and violent as his own instrument of sweet, all-consuming imagination held by its own vibration. Mind, mind, mind pulled taut in its bony shell, dreaming up heaven and hell. Thank you, everybody. Robert, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My only disappointment is that we can't take you to dinner, which we would do if you were in Bristol. <laughs> so I hope you'll take a rain check and we'll do that next time. One day. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night.